Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you about one quick thing. It's a website that's put together by Spookbrain, who's the author of tonight's story as well, as well as the previous Death Coach story. Spookbrain.com is a website created by this author that's going to be featuring numerous incredible stories and a bunch of spine-tingling stories for Halloween. The official launch for it is going to be on Halloween night, and if you're looking for new stories and new authors and new experiences and contests, then this is going to be a great place to be able to check out and spend your Halloween. Okay, on to tonight's story. Death coaches are solitary creatures. Not by choice, mind you. It's a life that we're forced to lead. To be a death coach is to be stripped of all familiarity and sent adrift in a vast sea of isolation. We travel from town to town, client to client, wandering nomads who never settle down for more than a month. There's a certain beauty to our lifestyle, if you look hard enough, but it's certainly not for the faint of heart. As is always the case, there are exceptions to this rule. If the agency deems a case to be particularly dangerous, they'll assign two death coaches as a precautionary measure. This is not out of an abundance of caution for our safety, but rather to ensure success. I've been paired with a partner twice in my career, and although the first was memorable, the second time was something else entirely. I met Sebastian in a downtrodden bar in Defiance, Missouri, off the Katy Trail. He was a burly man with an unkempt beard, a rotund belly peeking through a stained shirt. Sebastian, I presume, her little, uh, chunkier than I imagine. Extending my hand, I greeted him with a sly smirk. You must be Alex. You're as much of an asshole as they say. He gripped my hand until my knuckles cracked. Well, this should be fun. I motioned the waitress for a stiff drink and a pizza. So, can you bring me up to speed? I haven't had much time to read the case notes, I said flippantly, annoyed there was no pizza on the menu. Yeah, no problem, but you're buying. I ordered Sebastian a frosty mug of beer as the waitress kept ignoring him. I'll give you the summary version. Seems like your style anyway. Go for it. He was right on that one. The client's name is Brett Davis. He's a disgraced professor suspected of several horrific child abductions. Sebastian took a long pull from his drink. Just as the cops were closing in, he took his own life. His pointer finger against his temple, thumb raised high. Sebastian pantomimed a gunshot. A pair of ponytailed bikers entered the bar, eyeing us suspiciously. They sat in a corner booth, whispering to each other. About five years ago, a rash of disappearances swept through this area. A handful of kids are still missing. But we know what the police don't know. Or... No, we'll believe. Sebastian slid over a manila folder filled with photos. The agency captured these images. A half-decomposed man, tattered garments clinging to flaking skin, appeared in a series of grainy pictures. His shadow jutted unnaturally in multiple directions, creeping over paved sidewalks and streets. There's more. Much more. They'll do you a favor and spare you. Just trust me when I say Professor Davis was, and still is, a monster. He was as much of a devil as he is a man. Not that there's much of a difference between the two. Sebastian ended with it, a nihilistic flourish. Don't worry about me. I'm all too familiar with the devil, Sebastian. More than you'd like to know. I dragged a cigarette deeply. Now keep this in mind, partner. Every monster... Even monsters can be saved, I responded with, him, with my off-derided ideology. Sebastian and I rendezvoused in the hotel lobby the following morning, reeking of poorly cleaned sheets and stale coffee. This place is shit. Weirdly familiar, though. Is it a chain? Sebastian asked, inquisitively. No, uh, this is the one and only Country Moon Motel. And let's thank God for that. We chuckled lightly at my joke. A few elderly guests sauntered by, barely glancing at us, talking loudly on their cell phone. The young woman at the front desk chattered on, blissfully ignorant to the world going by. I'm going to run through the plan once more. Got to study hard if we're dealing with a professor, right? My second joke fell flat. Tough crowd. Anyway, 
Our target location is Professor Davis's summer home, which remains abandoned. All the missing kids lived within a five-mile radius of the house. Can you hurry this up? I've rehearsed this ad nauseum. Sebastian tapped his foot nervously, biting his fingernails. Okay, okay. Uh, bullet points, then. Role reversal. You and I are going to the house tonight, going to do some dangerous and poorly paid work, and hopefully convince a murderous entity to cross over to the other side. And if we can't convince him, we salt his bones, send him to hell. Right? Unlike me, Sebastian was less... forgiving. Not that this was surprising. Yeah, I guess that's right. Why don't you bring the salt? I replied sarcastically. That night, Sebastian and I split a ride to a vineyard, a short walk from Professor Davis's house. A clear night sky dotted with brilliant stars extended beyond the horizon. A chorus of cicadas chirped mournfully. Are you cold? I'm pretty cold. It was a sweltering, humid night, but Sebastian was shivering. I am ready to get this over with. That's what I am, I answered dismissively. Coming up to the end of a fenced-off dirt road, we pointed our flashlight beams across a field of tall grass and wildflowers. A fresh trail cut through the unruly vegetation, winding towards a decaying, vintage farmhouse. Stay alert. I think we have company. The, the living kind. We crouched down, creeping onto the makeshift path. Insects chirped all around us. Sweat drenched my back, dripping down like a leaky faucet. Sebastian continued to shiver, his teeth chattering like chains. Being a death coach isn't for everyone. Even death coaches. End of the road, boy. The bikers from the bar emerged stealthily out of the darkness, brandishing pistols with Confederate engravings. Sebastian let out a surprised shriek, cowering behind me. The bikers chuckled, slapping each other on the back like triumphant teammates. Professor Davis sends his regards. The biker's voice morphed into a silky and elegant drawl, eyes rolling back until blood vessels were visible. Possession is a common form of defense employed by the no longer living, although only the most dim-witted fall prey to it. It takes a weak, feeble mind to be controlled by the dead, and in those bikers, Professor Davis had found easy pickings. No need to send regards. He'll be able to give them himself. Reaching into my pocket, I cupped a handful of fine white powder and blew it into the biker's face. They screamed and clawed at their skin, collapsing into a convulsing heap before finally going limp. Death coaches, just like the dead, utilize a variety of self-defense techniques. Possession powder is one of those tools. A potent chemical cocktail that expunges unwanted entities from a host body. It is an agonizingly painful process. One that I experienced firsthand during a particularly disastrous mission. Quick thinking. Now how did he know we were coming? Sebastian cautiously stepped over the unconscious bikers, who groaned miserably in their sleep. Not sure, but that's irrelevant. We have a job to finish, and if possible, I'd like to get back before the pizza joint closes. Sebastian was hesitant to continue, but it's not like either of us had a say in the matter. There's no such thing as a failure when you're a death coach. You either complete the mission or die trying. That's technically a third option, but uh, it's not even worth mentioning. Dark oval windows peered down like the distrustful gaze of an owl, watching intently as we approached the back door. With a gentle push, it creaked open on rusty hinges. Stale, damp air washed over us, much colder than outside. Footsteps rattled the ceiling, sending dust and plaster tumbling to the ground. Guess someone's home, I muttered. Why don't you lead the way? I'll take the rear. Sebastian huddled against me as we climbed the stairs. A stifling shroud permeated the top floor. Thick shag carpet, yellowed from years of neglect, stretched down a narrow hallway. Four doors shut tight lined the wall. Two on each side. The footsteps had stopped, but the house crooned like a hoarse soprano. I'm starting to think I won't be eating pizza tonight. Shadows stretched around our flashlights, begging us to come closer. Let's get the last door on the left. I got a feeling about that one. Sebastian followed like a lost puppy. A hiss of air like a deflating balloon accompanied with the whimpering hinges as the door swung open. 
As we passed through the door frame, we were led into another hallway, exactly the same as the one we'd left. Don't close the goddamn door! Sebastian had already closed it, his eyes wide with fear. Great. Now we're stuck in an endless hallway. I squawked angrily. Powerful spirits have the ability to manipulate and interact with physical spaces, creating distorted mazes that trap victims until they go mad or starve. Death coaches refer to them as endless hallways. I'd already been stuck in three up until this point, the longest stretch being five weeks. I'm gonna salt the fucker's bones, Sebastian roared. His pride dealt a serious blow. You could do that, I suppose, but then we'd be trapped here. Well, forever. So maybe you want to rethink the plan. Sebastian shrugged his shoulders. Usually the best thing to do in this situation is search until we find an exit, but that takes time, and I'm not much for company. So let's go with plan B. Plan B? Perplexed, Sebastian teetered his head to the left. Yeah, plan B. Before we could react, I sprayed a black, viscous liquid into his eyes. Sorry, bud. This is the easiest way, and just not the most pleasant. Sebastian rolled on the ground, squealing in pain. I'd... Spritzed him with a highly diluted neurotoxin, which creates a chemical and physical reaction that is, well, comparable to catnip for dark spirits. Needless to say, they love it. I wasn't in the mood for waiting, and I doubted Sebastian would agree, so I went ahead and made an executive decision. I felt kind of bad, but I was sure that he'd thank me once it was over. Better to be in pain for hours than miserable for weeks. And when he shall die, take him and cut him into little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with the night and pay no worship to the garish sun. A baritone voice with an elegant draw quoting Shakespeare floating through the halls. The door clattered with its echoes. I'm more of a mindless action movie guy, but thanks for the brush up and the classics, I responded mockingly. A rotting man wearing an angled sweater vest, hanging on by threads, materialized to the ceiling, his bloody eyes fixated on Sebastian. Spirits swooped from the rafters like a screeching bat before he could descend upon my partner. I produced a faded notebook from my bag and threw it on the ground. Remember this, baby? I shouted. A Treatise on Man's Infernal Affliction. The original copy of Professor Davis's manifesto, his life's work, lay coldly on a grime-covered carpet. His spirit momentarily pacified. Professor Davis began assiduously flipping through the journal's pages. Then, something strange happened. Well, strange from the hardened perspective of a death coach, who frequently deals with the supernatural. Sebastian glided effortlessly to his feet as if a pulley had dragged him, no longer showing signs of impairment from the toxins completely transfixed. He joined Professor Davis in lovingly caressing the pages of the manifesto. A blinding flash of light exploded as their fingertips collided, sending me careening into a wall. As the light cleared, I saw Sebastian and Professor Davis spinning rapidly around each other, a circle growing tighter and tighter and tighter until they were practically touching lips. Sebastian began to transform, his limbs shortening and belly receding, and the closer he got to Professor Davis, the more he resembled him until they were indistinguishable from one another. Well, I didn't see that coming. I mumbled softly. A chorus of children's laughter flooded through the halls, reverberating off every corner as the laughter crescendoed and disordered into something demonic. Sebastian and Professor Davis merged into a single entity, wailing in anguish. The ground beneath Professor Davis's feet dissolved, morphing into a cavernous pit, wisps of fire licking its sides. Dozens of tiny hands burst forth from the hole, grasping Sebastian, Professor Davis, whatever, down into the abyss. Humans are complex creatures, harboring seemingly incongruent philosophies in the same mind. A man can be evil and good all at once, but sometimes one side triumphs over the other. Professor Davis committed untold atrocities, true, but he could also display genuine empathy and compassion. He cared deeply about his students, worked tirelessly to promote sustainable practices, volunteered regularly in soup kitchens, but also 
lived with obsessive and murderous impulses he could never seem to quell. When a person passes over marred by conflicting visions, their soul can split in two. Light and dark. Taking separate forms, and when I unwittingly connected Sebastian with Professor Davis, their souls merged once more and a certain justice, but not, not redemption, was wrought. I wouldn't have gone through with it if I had known. But the agency was well aware of my proclivity for independence that they planned ahead. They manipulated me every step of the way, and I could only guess what they'd done to Sebastian to make him believe he was a death coach, let alone why. Not that it mattered. And not that I cared. Not that I'd say. My mission had been completed, and that's all that meant anything. Even if it meant nothing at all. Once I exited the house, I lit up a lonely cigarette and I watched trails of smoke dissipate with the wind. I felt a tinge of jealousy. Dreading my next assignment, I ambled back to the hotel. Dreaming of pizza. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode, This October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify, or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube, or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. If any of you guys are interested in some of the audiobooks or actual books that have horror stories in them that I've worked on, you can always check out that description down below. In there, there's a couple of different links to some horror books and horror audiobooks and new things, like hopefully there'll be a Tales from the Gas Station Volume 3 link down there in the next few days, which I'm referring to right now, because if you look and it's out, it'll be there. <laughs> also, I wanted to say thank you all of you who are supporting me on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Kraus, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Anne Charon, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderfully happy Halloween. Sweet dreams.